we're live. Um, this is another Zentanol or Sync Angel IPM uh, live stream on Instagram. I'll be joined by uh, Aaron the Grower. He's already here because I asked him if he was ready. And now I'm going to. Not the Snickle Fritz, hello. Addo Swan, hello. Cultivaris Hemp, hello. Hey there. Oh, I can't hear you. That's not good. I can't hear you at all. Hmm. Maybe you need to update your Instagram app. That usually happens to me. Can you hear me? Ah, I can hear you now, I think. Okay. How are we doing? Better. Okay. I can hear you. Hmm. Cool. You have a... So what, what's the topic today? Trichomontogeny. This is a very complex thing to uh, to research, and um, there certainly is a few resources um, that we will kind of clue everybody into today. But this is a uh, this is this is a lot of fun and also dense. I will say in vocabulary. If anybody has a chance to check out the Payne 1978 paper, it's it's extremely dense. So I hope to be able to expand on some of this density um, today with you. And to start it off, I would hope that, that um, we can talk about really, let's just start basic and work our way up the ladder. What is a trichome and what, uh, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, so, so put really basically, trichomes are specific structures that plants have um they are so, so trichome basically means hair in latin technically these are trichomes and these are trichomes and these are trichomes too sort of but you know we conserve the latin terminology or greek maybe trichome might be greek you know how it is with science words but um <laughs> trichome is basically like a out a protruding structure and particularly with plants um, it has many different, they have many different kinds of functions. People who are familiar with cannabis um, and many other kinds of plants uh, are pretty familiar with the trichomes that have sort of a glandular sort of head on them, but they also have, they can have so many different sorts of shapes and sizes. And um, like you say, it's very dense. So it, it's sort of one of those things where when we talk about trichomes, and since the topic is ontogeny, I'll go over that too. Um, their ontogeny essentially means like their, their developmental biology. So what does that mean? That means like, how did the trichome generally come to be like in plants? And how does it develop in the various different groups of plants specifically? So like, just like any other structure, Functionally, it probably has some some it has some sort of function. Um, it has also some sort of influence from the environment and its own genes that produces that function. And there are myriad functions out there. You even uh, in our correspondence before this live stream, we do prepare for these for those who don't know. Um, uh, you even touch on a few of them, right? Like temperature regulation. Yeah, temperature regulation was one that was really cool. Um, the most interesting one uh, was, was, was water loss mitigation. And this was very interesting mm -hmm. to me because um, in cannabis farming, we value trichome production, obviously, right? We want density. We want like lots and lots of trichomes and we want them to be large. So that's great. <laughs> Enjoy. That is great until we get to the point of too much density and water can no longer escape. And so what happens is the perfect environment for botrytis to form happens. So I think there's something to be said for a balance. Like there's a reason nature didn't evolve trichomes to be 
every single cell. It, it's, it, you know, it, there's an inhibitory activation when a trichome is created or grow, begins to grow. There's an inhibitory action that happens in the neighboring cells that literally shuts off the ability to produce uh, trichomes from those epidermal uh, cells. And so that all relates to maybe why some strains are more prone to get bud rot, botrytis, um, whereas others, you know, usually less dense and less trichomy uh, don't. Don't what? Don't get botrytis. Don't necessarily get botrytis. Oh, I see. Yes. Um, right. I remember you talking about that, how like in um, sort of the expression of the genes that are associated with the structures that like there is sort of an inhibitory effect. And that was really interesting. Kind of not surprising. Right. But that's why we do these sorts of tests. Why That's why people look into these sorts of things. Like for one thing, I remember reading a research report where they essentially call trichomes like um, sort of metabolic factories, uh, you know, and that's a very sort of apt, you know, way to put it. It's an oversimplification maybe because there's other functions that they have except besides secondary metabolite production, but that's a big part of it. And, you know, we're talking about this within the both, both like ecologically, so like without human cultivation, but also, you know, with the emphasis of human cultivation of plants and, you know, there's a lot of things and trichomes that we want. So how do we make more of it? How, you know, what influences that? And so knowing that plants kind of have this inhibitory function where they don't want to put trichomes, they don't want to make them so trichomous that, you know, it's a, it's a super dense forest, but maybe you know, want is sort of not the right word here, but like, you know, I could see how through millions of years of adaptation, like, and I've definitely seen it in some plants where the trichomes are really, really closely spaced, but they are spaced, you know. Um, Absolutely. And I don't think you're going to find, I guess that's what I was kind of getting at in the extreme end of what I was saying is you're never going to find, um, a plant that has evolved in nature to be so, uh, God, let me get the nomenclature correct here since I have pain pulled up. Uh, so, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to use words that maybe everybody's familiar with. So That's a good idea. you're never going to, you're never going to find a calyx or a bract that is so abundant with trichomes that, <clears throat> there's a tipping point, I guess, right? You're never going to find something that's so, that you can't cover something in trichomes in nature and expect it to survive into maturity without rotting. Okay. Is that what the research said or? No, no, no. That's, <laughs> no, that's, uh, well, the research says that, you know, this is, this is something that I'm inferring from research that okay. ba basically says, but, you know, uh, the research doesn't talk about botrytis. Botrytis is is something that I have had experience with in denser colas. I've just never thought about it being a, um, a byproduct of abundance of trichomes. Okay. I realize yeah. this is slightly tangented from from the yeah, article, but. But I think that like that speaks to the fact that we're using research reports to make sort of interpretations. And ne neither of us are botanists. Neither of us are trichome scientists or anything like this. And actually, from my from my own just personal looking into it, it doesn't seem like um, well because they're so small, perhaps. And I think I've even read that in in some research that like partly because trichomes are so small. Partly because, like, in this research report, the one that I posted when we talked, talking about this live stream here, um, mm -hmm. the title is Cannabis Glandular Trichomes Alter, and I have it up here, Morphology and Metabolite Content During Flower Maturation, specifically in cannabis, right? So, you know, it, the, the kinds of things, they, the, the techniques and the sort of resources that they have to utilize to study this sort of thing um, is very sophisticated. And a lot of it, I don't think was available even like two decades ago, 
four decades ago, right? What what year was that pain um trichome document? Seventy eight nineteen seventy eight, right? So the late seventies compared to now, you know, our ability to look at the super small, especially the transcriptomics and that sort of a thing that would influence the genes that influence the structures that that are trichomes, like, you know, like the difference between late seventies tech and twenty twenty tech is major, right? Totally. To say, to say it very, uh, uh, Dude, they simply. are sticking, they are sticking micro needles into the interest in, intercellular spaces, spaces, and and with and pulling out the fluids. Not only are they electron microscoping, they are physically interacting with the fluids in the intercellular space and testing them. Dude, we've come so far; it's incredible. I mean, yeah. this study. I, I just want to. I just want to put this part here on uh, for those who are if they're following along with the PDF or with the research report, which, by the way, anyone who wants any of these research reports or any of this information, I, I just want to always incentivize that we're not talking out of, you know, thin air here. We're, we're, we're looking at research reports, we're interpreting them, and we're making these assessments that way. Sometimes we're not even making our own interpretations, like it's literally what's in the paper, and I try to stick to that as much as possible. But for those who want to know, you know, just on that tangent, like uh, on the paper, they go over all the different things they do here. So they use a cryo scanning electron microscope analysis, a solid phase micro extraction, um, gas chromatography. Um, let's see here, micro capillary sample trichome cannabinoid analysis via ultra performance liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. So yeah, that's what I was like, talking about. Yeah, capillary extraction. It, what? Yeah, yeah. So you know that this is a very sophisticated technology that's being employed, and um, that's just that just wasn't necessarily po even if it was possible. Like even if we had the technology, it wasn't necessarily available uh, in the way that it is now. To uh, cannabis researchers, nothing was especially available. Especially cannabis researchers, right? Yeah, especially so. Yeah, that's yeah. why That's why a lot of the research I found, um, or one of the, man, one of the most interesting and fun to read research papers was the, was the uh, grapes, if rare, very layman mm -hmm. term, grapes trichome paper. Yeah, um, I liked that one too. Uh, what, what was the, uh, the author of that one was... Uh, that was the Z Yao Ma, two thousand sixteen. Okay. Um, it was fun because this is a really good way to get introduced to the ontogeny of of trichomes. Um, it's very detailed. It is uh, succinct and goes over some really basic foundational concepts that exist on sort of i think 30 percent of plants on earth have trichomes is that right i think i i made a research or, or not research report i made a video about a research report and i think it was exactly this research report where i cited that uh that quote and i think it's land plants specifically right 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 well even yeah. algae has trichomes this is true but i don't know if they looked you know, in that, in that way. I don't know yeah. if they looked so comprehensively, but, um, but yeah, like, but you would think it would be more than 30%, huh? Um, maybe. you might, but maybe people aren't aware of the different types of trichomes, you know, maybe you don't know that there's a, that the woolly trichomes or downy, I believe they're called downy. Downy? Downy trichomes. Essentially it's uh, it's like, I can't think of the uh, example they gave, but if you've ever seen a leaf that's sort of like covered in a mossy, uh, you know, sort of spiderweb looking substance that isn't, obviously we're not talking about fungus here. Oh yeah, like uh, dandelions sometimes have, or like, exactly. uh, or, or hawk's beard or false dandelions. They have that like waxy kind of white residue. Is that what downy, are those downy trichomes? 
I, that's my understanding. Yes. Um, Is so, that true? I just learned something because I've always wondered what those were. I yeah, thought it was some it, like exodit or something, but maybe it is, you know, I'll look into that though. Downy trichomes. For the most part, from my research, they're unicellular, highly branched or, you know, brachiated, um, unicellular, highly, highly branching, webby, sort of uh, non-glandular trichomes. And how do you know how they're like um, kind of produced or? Um, it does seem like they arise from similar enzyme activity as the other um, biological processes that happen when trichomes start to emerge from the epidermis. But mm -hmm. this is obviously, I think most of the time they mentioned in this study that I read um, that this was happening mostly on vegetative tissue. This is not something that usually happens on a flowering plant. So that's why we don't find much of it in the research, but I found it in pain. Uh, I think it was pain. I found a little bit, no, it was in both. So I was cross-referencing as I was reading these two studies, which by the way, is a really good idea. You want the pain study. Let me just tell you for my layman friends out there, you want the pain study in one window and every other study in the other window, because it's, it's like a dictionary. I agree. He had, uh, tons of um, great adjectives, which maybe not all of them were, were his, right? But like, that's, I totally agree with you because that study goes over all of these different versions of trichomes. Now, you've heard of people talk about like types of trichomes, right? Like, um, like a, I'm familiar with the tomato sort of trichome uh, sort of morphology where it's like a type one, a type two, a type three, a type four. I think type five and maybe even a type six type six i think it goes up to type six for tomatoes yeah yeah, yeah. and so like there <laughs> when they're classifying the trichomes um they're using a particular sort of classification maybe rubric that is sort of specific to tomatoes i feel like is that was that your interpretation right that is my interpretation yeah that's why they're called they, there's a special name for them and it's it's had tomato is literally a part of the word i can't remember what it is but oh okay like morpho yeah like tomato morpho you know genesis or trichome genesis something like yeah, that. yeah tomato remember myself. Morpho. oh god okay all right <laughs> but you're right i think that i remember it being the case that sort of the like you can't extrapolate is my point you can't you can't um, look at one species of plant and extrapolate the sort of um, sort of trichome assessment or classification sort of strategy uh, to other plants because for one thing, and that's why I talk about, that's why my point about this video is trichome ontogeny is that um, you can't do this because from an evolutionary biology or developmental biology perspective you don't want that you 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 can't you can't say that this is going to be the same or comes from the same exact um sort of uh source essentially the uh, the genes might be different maybe the aggregate genes aren't but the um the Certainly specific some like, how they're expressed yeah I think part of it is like there's like some co-expression happen or co there's co-expression happening so um one of the things that the study that the cannabis specific trichome study mentioned um getting the name on it the oh gosh uh livingston 19 um Certainly there was, um, oh Jesus, what were we just talking about? I just started reading it and I forgot what I was actually looking for. Like the different, um, like how you cannot extrapolate, like grape trichome, you know, morphogenesis That's is right. going to be different from tomato, which is going to be different from cannabis. You can't say the type one trichomes of tomato are going to be like the type one trichomes or, or exactly, or rather they might be very similar but they're not exactly the same as the trichomes of any other different species, particularly. 
Yeah, and, maybe and we're talking about a species that's you know ninety eight percent genetically similar. So tomatoes and cannabis, as we know, most people know, are ninety eight percent genetically similar. And even with that kind of similarity, and even with the number of times that trichomes have evolved, individ you know individu individually from um, other plants with trichomes. Um, kind of tells us that there's something special and something to be desired evolutionarily and functionarily. Um, yeah, like they're conserved. So like they must have been doing something right. Yeah. Or at least they were, or at the very least, they weren't doing something wrong. Which is really wrong what... Enough, uh, wrong enough to be selected against, I suppose. Exactly. It's like, it's more, evolution tends to be more about the lack of of your demise than it does the rise you know the rapidity of your success i guess yeah but, like neutral or detrimental select against sometimes um exactly. beneficial select for uh you know unless you get unless you get crushed in an avalanche and then that evolutionary line just goes away for no reason that has to do with the trichomes functionality that's another thing people that's another thing people don't realize is that like it's true that like in nature there is a certain level of like selection pressure right a, a great deal of it but like also there are cataclysmic events in human history not, not even just human history but evolutionarily for the last 500 million years where like it didn't matter how great your trichomes were you were dead <laughs> because a mountain exploded in lava and you yeah. know what i mean so no trichome to protect against lava, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately not. So there could be but, very... What? I was just going to say, but this is a great segue to talk about there are trichomes to prevent pests and particular pathogens. And I was, as I started reading about this stuff, I was like, dude, I have to make sure that you and I talk about how trichomes resist pests more than anything, because I'm so curious about how how that happened over time. So my first question mm -hmm. is, and I know I didn't put a lot of this in the outline that I sent you, but really this is like my pure at heart interest is like uh, evolutionarily, how did we get to <laughs> cannabis, like these, these metabolite producing micro, you know, extrusions? Yeah, so... I actually have that report up here. Um, now, unfortunately, I couldn't find the report because I ran out of time. And I'm going to, if I'm, so this live stream for those who are watching, um, this is going to be an IGTV video post as well. And so I, it'll be here for reference for anyone. So I want to say things, even things that I can't show at the moment. And I might even be putting it on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. So for those who are interested, um, you know, I'll have more information in the description there, perhaps. But algae even, algae even have, and it's not super surprising, right? Because uh, a lot of things were conserved. Chlorophyll, chloroplasts were conserved, conserved, for example. That's an example of something that from aquatic plants to land plants, um, you know, it was conserved in plant biology, very fundamental, you know, evo-devo, ev uh, evolutionary development, you know. Um, but uh, root hairs, root hairs is where we're go going with this. So this research report that's called um, Tryptocon and Caprice Mediate Lateral Inhibition During Trichome and Root Hair Patterning in Aridopsis, Aribidopsis, I should say. Aribidopsis is a model organism. It's a model plant that people use in experiments because, well, for a lot of reasons, it's convenient. Uh, we know a whole lot about it, especially nowadays since we've been using it as a model. And we can sort of either knock out genes. We can do this with other plants too, but specifically what we do is we either knock out genes in the plant to, to show how individual genes or groups of genes can influence certain things um, or we can overexpress them, or we can do all these things, and we have a really good idea of Arabidopsis, um, which I think is Thalecrest, Bittercrest, Thalecrest, 
Theoclastis. And this one, this this uh, species, if I'm not mistaken, was the one that they chose because, like, uh, when they were looking at trichomes, they they chose that species because of the things you mentioned, and also because the trichomes were mostly unicellular. Is is that does that sound right? Am I thinking of the same plant? I th I don't know if that was the logic, but there were probably other reasons. I think the main reason, though, is that it's just a model organism that we use. Um, so pedigree, so sort of. Because, because of all of the other research that we have on it and that we use in experiments, it means that we can we can extrapolate a lot more, or we don't even we ha we can make assertions because so many people have studied this one plant. Lucky uh, plant. Lucky plant, I guess. Right. Oh. Um, so these two genes, so these two genes, Tryptocon and Caprice, um, they're found in roots when we make root hairs, when the plants make root hairs, rather. And they're also uh, important for trichome genesis. So why is that? Why are genes that are so sort of, at least spatially, they're so, they're so distant, they're in totally different parts of the plant? Well, it's because you'll find that as you study the genome, and maybe I'm wrong because I'm not a genomicist here, but as I've studied the genome, sort of non, uh, gen non as a genomicist, there's a lot of conservation, like we were talking about, and genes sort of, you know, they get they get overexpressed or underexpressed, or you even get pseudo genes sometimes where they're not actual genes, but they have this sort of effect. Um, genes methylate, they demethylate, um, if I'm saying that, yeah, I believe, yeah. And, so, you and when you say methylate and demethylate, you're, you're essentially saying like, turn on, turn off. Is that a, is that a layman way to understand that? Certain processes. Yeah. 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 So, so tons of things happen to genes and DNA in general. Um, D it's really DNA methylation that I'm kind of referring to here, mm -hmm. but genes get conserved. Like we were just talking about. And then they sometimes get disrupted or mutations happen where the genes either get, they get copied in different places or they get reduced in certain places. So all tons of things can happen, uh, even whether it's sexual or asexual reproduction. We're quite, so like, oftentimes people are taught that sexual reproduction has a, a huge benefit. And that's that you take the, the genes, the genetic information, and you combine it. And that's usually beneficial because of that, that hybridization, that variation for like pathogens and other sorts of things, especially if you're successful, those things will go on. But there's a huge cost to sexual reproduction as well. And that's making sure that you find a mate yeah. um, in, Tell me about in this it, right? world. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, but even in asexual reproduction, uh, this can also happen where like, just because because the reproductive process is not perfect, you can't help but have mutations at some point in some way. And over time, even those mutations through asexual reproduction can have sort of interesting effects, um, like copy number variations and that sort of a thing. So basically just to sort of, since I've bogarted the entire conversation about this subject, these two genes are expressed in trichomes, but they also um, are important for root hair development. So it's just kind of an interesting thing to consider. Um, in my cannabis IPM video, the global IPM video, I go over a lot of different things. Oh, I think I have a lot. Oh, no, there you're back. You're back. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. I'm loud and clear. Okay, I got a phone okay. call. You know, I just realized I can put my phone on do not disturb. So that's what I just did. So I see. Um, yeah, so basically, long story short, um, like in the I was talking about in my IPM video that like, even so like for mycorrhizal interaction between um, legumes, for example, with rhizobia, um, or diazotrophs and that sort of a thing. Like pollen tube, the genes that allow for like pollen tube formation. So like when the pollen uh, hits the the um, the pistil and it, it bores the pollen tube and goes into the ovule and all that sort of stuff. Those genes related to that 
are also important. If those didn't develop, then we wouldn't have like the fungal symbiosis that we have. Isn't that crazy that like the genes related to that got co-opted to be helpful for cell invagination by uh, sort of myco mycorrhizal um, interactions? Like that's just so crazy to me. Wow. That kind of thing is, is fascinating. So similarly to that, root hair genes and trichome genes, not all, but some, are they related? They're yeah. used uh, in tandem. Which, you know, as like a living soil grower, you know, I mean, I've heard people mention root hairs and how these are, my understanding was that like, okay, these are things that basically precurse larger root growth, but that is not the case. Root hairs are in reference to sort of trichomontogeny. Um, root hairs are more like trichomes. They grow, they live for two or three weeks absorbing uh, minerals and exuding uh, all kinds of metabolites. And then they break off and die in two or three weeks usually. And that's different from the sessile trichomes and the bulbous and the stopped trichomes. These actually grow they, they, they have like stages of ontogeny where they, they kind of become from the epidermis, they grow a head and then they grow a pre-stalk if they are a pre-stalked trichome and then they grow a stalk and then they, the, the head um, matures and sometimes you'll even see like twin heads come off of certain strains or varieties. Um, yeah. So they act different in maturity, but they arise from the same sort of like enzymatic action within the plant. And it's sort of meta like metaphorically or poetically, it's kind of cool to consider it like that. Like root hairs are sort of like sort of like a special uh underground trichome, but instead of like you know what I mean and I I I'm definitely not somebody who has all the comprehensive knowledge about root hairs and what they do, but you're right. That's th those are the things that I am aware of sort of like root exudate mucilage, um, uh, how they, I think you even mentioned in our correspondence, how they're sticky. They can like, they'll keep sort of soil intact together in that rhizosphere area, that very small area between the rhizoplane, the root surface and the sort of influential sphere that they, they have. Are Trichomes act as little fingers. They are like the plants, you know, a lot of times they can act with their, with, in combination with their, the way that they exude and the way that they absorb, they can act as like fingers. They grab onto stuff and they feed the plant. So it's like this action that they have, this multifunction um, purpose, just like they have up above where, mm -hmm. you know, they protect. I, and, you know, I bet, this isn't in the research, but I bet that root hairs have regulate temperature underground as well. Like all that stuff is, is relevant. Yeah, it would be interesting to see, and maybe it's already out there. Maybe we just need to discover it um, or beat a paywall. But um, there, there may be a lot more to it than that as well. But it's kind of sort of, it's interesting at least to consider that the genes that those two genes, the tryptocon and the caprice, for example, are in both, they're important for both um, sort of genesis in that way, sort of uh, subterranean and supraterranean mm -hmm. uh, trichomes can be produced, I suppose. But I, I wouldn't quite say that root hairs are uh, trichomes of a different name, but they're more like they de the, at least part of their function derives from that, or at least their structural development which is just kind of fascinating to me. It happens all the time and we're just not aware of it. You know, uh, genes are weird. And this is just another example of that. Um, I want to also talk about, because I have it up here, um, just so that we do talk about it. I just want to sort of, this is mostly paraphrased from the other research report I mentioned about the sort of cannabis development where they use all that sophisticated technology. So they say that um, basically that ontogenetically or on, ontogenally, uh, there is a difference between the stalked and the sessile trichomes. So 
what they found was that, especially on floral tissue, um, tri there were like there were sessile trichomes and there were stalked trichomes that they were looking at specifically. Well, for one thing, they said that non-glandular hairs were incorrectly classified as capitate sessile trichomes in the research report called um, Analysis of Cannabinoids in Laser Microdissected Trichomes of Medicinal Cannabis Sativa Using Liquid Chromatography Mass Spectrometry and Cryogenic Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, or NMR, um, and therefore did not compare the sessile glandular trichomes as defined by other researchers. So Stuff sometimes you mess up on the on the taxa, and your whole study is bogus, huh? It does kind of suck when that happens, doesn't it? Right, but that's yeah, why we yeah. do the research. That's why replication support. There we go. There we go. Um, so, assuming people see it at the same direction that I'm seeing it, and it's not mirrored, on the right side we have the. It's not totally focused, but it's okay. It's good for, good enough for this diagram. The on the very right we have a sessile trichome. That's a true sessile trichome. That is, it's a sessile trichome that stays sessile. And it's got more sesquiterpenes than monoterpenes, right? Is that what it says? Yeah, I'm I'm being uh, Vanna White here. I'm I'm like, I and here we that. have our sessile with uh, sesquiterpenes over monoterpenes. But what but what the interesting thing about the research report was that, especially on floral tissue, the, some of those, a lot of those sessile trichomes were actually just stalk trichomes that didn't stalk up. They didn't become stalk trichomes yet. And they were able to tell the difference, but they were only able to tell the difference because of this sophisticated technology. Um, this, the pre-stalked sessile trichomes had a great amount of monoterpenes. And so did the stalked trichomes also had the large uh, monoterpenes. So they were able to tell because they did sort of a, um, both a genetic analysis um, as well as a sort of structural and sort of a chemical analysis. And that was the only way they were able to arrive at that conclusion sort of um, explicitly without very much ambiguity. Yeah, it definitely, this is not, the difference between a sessile trichome and a pre-stalked trichome um, is not something you're gonna be able to observe with your naked eye. They definitely. Look, I, they or your naked identical. nose, or your naked nose for that matter. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is all chemical analysis and, and also mm -hmm. electron microscopy. And another differentiating factor, I think you might have touched on this in our correspondence, but I'm not sure if you, if you said it yet, which is the eight uh, disc cells, the secretory cells in the sessile trichomes. They, did you say this already, that sessile trichomes actually will not develop like like bona fide sessile trichomes will not develop more than eight secretory disc cells. Is that correct? I didn't mention that part. I did not mention that part, but that's true. So right. they also found that you could look at the secretory discs. So the um, the the stalked trichomes had more than eight. The sessile trichomes only had eight secretory discs. So you know the, so those that... so those. I'm Sorry, just going to say those discs are important for like the secretion. That's what the secretory part of that word means. They're secreting those compounds into the trichomes. So this is really cool too, because um, while the, the, the trichome is developing, um, it uses its intercellular space to store these um, metabolite fluids or volatile substances. And as it matures and becomes a stocked trichome, it actually develops enzymes that break down the walls of those structures that allow, um, that allow the metabolites like terpenes and cannabinoids to, to literally just layer inside of that ap apical, is it apical cell, the top, you know, the, mm -hmm. the top cell. Um, so in other words, long story short, as it's growing, it contains this volatile metabol these volatile metabolites or the monoterpenes. And as it grows into a full stocked trichome, 
it can then begin to layer inside instead of just being in the intercellular spaces. It's layering this fluid as a giant droplet on top of the hmm. apical, you know, head, which is like why inside you want to head. let it mature. Inside the head. Or inside the head, but inside outside the head, but layered, layered inside the head, sort of like here's the head, it's kind of layered vertically or whatever. Well, it doesn't necessarily layer. I'm saying layer because the way I think about it is it's like releasing this fluid over time. So layered in its chronological presence, but like, for instance, in this photo, you have fluid trapped in the intercellular space, as well as sort of starting to we exude. Can see it. P oh, push shit, it a little bit more. Yeah, no, it's cool. Okay. Okay, so in this photo, they're, for more or less, for, for lack of better words, the, the volatile compounds are in the intercellular space. And in mm -hmm. this photo, they are one giant droplet, along with a few others, on top of these secretory cells. So instead of being amongst the secretory cells in the intercellular space, they, they sort of become this, this mass, this glob, which is oh, why we want to let trichomes mature, sort of, as from a grower perspective, you know, this is what we're doing. That's so cool. Actually, you reminded me, for two things I want to say. One is that uh, uh, David Heldrith is in the comments, um, and he's the person who supplied me with this particular research report. So shout out to him, the Yogi Bear 13 on Instagram. Just, I just want to bring that up because I'm all about transparency. Um, I really appreciate it. We wouldn't be able to have this conversation without it. Um, and I also wanted to say that you reminded me of the fact that um, they sampled in this research report fresh material and not like dried material or cured material. And what they note is that it resulted in a lot higher monoterpene to sesquiterpene ratio than was previously reported in samples from other research reports where they were dried for hours, they say hours, weeks, or months. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I mean, sort of intuitively that makes sense because they're volatile compounds and the trichomes get broken through harvest and that sort of a thing, like kind of obviously. But again, it's sort of, sort of important because maybe from the, at the very end as a product, as a finished product, you know, you might make inferences about the finished product and the samples that maybe aren't very true when they're still being functionally useful for the plant when it's alive. I guess. Absolutely, which is what makes this, this research so incredibly relevant over other papers that I skimmed while doing this. You know, um, uh, Tao, my, my good buddy Tao here asked, our, our good buddy Tao asked, uh, what's the actual amber color from when, when, we, uh, when we are letting the the trichome mature. Um, that is the, in my, to my understanding, that is the actual oxidization of these compounds and the outer layer yeah, of the really? cell itself. Yeah, I thought it was something to, I was, in my mind, I was like, it's oxidation of some kind, but I don't know of what exactly, or if it's everything, or if it's only some things, you know. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. I, I, so also, a, I also, I also love, understand that to be the case. Yes. Yeah. And I love, I love when people ask questions like that, because really what we're trying to do is not like we, we kind of live in the data, but what we want to do is sort of like ground that out like an electrical current and bring it back down to like what we can yeah. all understand and how it applies to our garden and stuff. Yeah. Why does it happen? Why does this specific thing happens, you know, in, you know, in relation to another thing or another multiple things, right? Sort of interdisciplinarily, how does this occur? Um, yeah. I want to make sure that I get all my important notes uh, in this yeah, video. Yeah. But, um, so. yeah, so they say that um, stalked glandular trichomes uh, are a terminal stage of development arising from sessile-like glandular trichomes on cannabis floral tissues. They specifically looked at floral um, trichomes versus foliar trichomes as well. 
and they found that there was a disparity there as well that the stalked trichomes uh, on the floral tissue in particular um, were sort of a terminal end to the sessile trichomes, most of them. Some of them, however, uh, while they were sessile, they weren't the true sessile trichomes that were their own thing that never turned into stalks. Um, they were, they just didn't turn into, they didn't turn to stalks for some reason. And they don't really give a reason as to why, but right. I imagine that just like a lot of things with regards to the, like where structures may fail to terminate or may fail to do one or another thing that they normally do, it's just probably a genetic thing, environmental thing, could be, probably is both of some it's kind. Probably, I would guess it's like inhibitory enzymatic action, just like, like so like when a, when a trichome erupts, it, it notifies its neighbors not to do that. And maybe sometimes mm -hmm. it only halfway notifies it. Maybe it only erupts one or two of the co-influences to, to shut that, that genetic marker off. And so that stalk never actually grows. And so what they've categorized those as are pre-stocked trichomes. And sort of like you, I would presume that, honestly, if you gave the plant enough time to mature, maybe you'd see even more of those pre-stocked turn into fully stocked mature trichomes. Yeah, right. Or, um, you know, like, if there's like a genetic switch or something or multiple genetics, which is kind of like what you're describing, then or like the enzymes that might be produced by the genetic effect, or, you know, however you want to put it, like, you know, like, for example, this is how evolution happens, right? Like, if you get a plant that like, kind of only makes sessile trichomes and doesn't make stock trichomes for some, you know, mutational reason, then, you know, you might, there might be sort of advantages that there are mostly sesquiterpenes and not monoterpenes, for example, in the plant, you know, like that kind of a thing might have an effect or might have a beneficial effect over hundreds of millions of years, or maybe a dozen or so millions of years. Um, maybe it's better for certain environments over others, or it's worse for most environments. So it can only live better in certain cases. Like, so having sort of like a, like a failure like that, it, you know, I can see how little changes like that can cause effects ecologically um, and definitely influences plant population dynamics. So that kind of stuff's really fascinating to me. It'd be interesting to see uh, sort of a difference between like uh, uncultivated populations versus cultivated populations. F sort of famously, uh, wild tomatoes where cultivated tomato comes from, they have a ton more trichomes and many different more compounds. A lot of the, some of them at least are toxic to people and other organisms. I like to bring it up because I'm, I'm sort of sensitive to solanine myself, which is in sol uh, Solanaceae, the nightshade family, which is kind of toxic. Actually, it's a saponin, believe it or not. Uh, solanine is a saponin. Oh, so, I, yeah. I, always, I always pronounce that saponin. I don't think that it's wrong or right to say. I, I think I yours no is probably more more accepted. Who knows? <laughs> Certainly not me. <laughs> but saponins, it sounds a little better, doesn't it? What? Um, saponin. Or it however sounds, you said it. How it did sounds you say uh, it? more artistic. 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 I, it's, I, I, it's more I like phonetically pleasing. Yes, I know what you meant. Yeah, it's more um, you put the right syllable or put, you put the right emphasis <laughs> on, the, on the right syllable, you know. There you go. You know I, yeah. I knew what you were saying, but saponin sounds better than saponin. I, I agree with you. <laughs> I but, um, I'm, I'm a lowly English speaker, so. Well, this isn't even English at that point, really. Uh, Good point. <laughs> so, Good point. You know, but um you know, it's just kind of cool. Like, also on that note, like, yeah, so I'm sensitive to those compounds. It's in wild cultivar, or not even cultivars, in wild populations more than cultivated populations. And, um, you know, there's obvious sort of downstream effects to that. And maybe we could sort of harness that. I don't know if it's necessarily more um, advantageous for us to sort of in cross the wild populations for that 
or not. Um, certainly, I don't really know if wild populations are more trichomous or less trichomous off the top of my head. But I think in the research report, the, the same one we've been kind of riffing on, uh, I think they do mention that there's a selection. So at least for the hemp versus the medicinal cultivars, there was a difference in trichome abundance where the medicinal ones had much more. So it's possible that the sort of wild populations don't actually have as many trichomes and that's a selection pressure from cultivation. Right. Yeah. Uh, domestication of trichomes, baby. Right. And so like, I mean, I've seen some, some, uh, some end product is super trichomous and it's amazing to me, even though you said that like they don't, they have that sort of inhibitory sort of space between them, only a very small amount, but it's like, it's massive. And uh, they still have quite a bit of them still a, a veritable forest of trichomes. That's it. I've Man, often... I love thinking about it like a forest of trichomes. P pause with me and jump down this rabbit hole for a second. You're, you're walking, you're walking through the forest. But the forest is actually a part of the trees. So, so in our reality, we think of the trees as a separate organism from the ground. But in the trichome forest, this is, this is one in the same. Maybe we should start right. thinking about the forest around us as one organism to, to better understand how it interacts. Are you saying we should see the forest for the trees? I'm saying we should, we should see the trees for the forest. For the forest of trichomes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. no, I love, I love that. No, 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 I love that metaphor um, because it's, because trichomes are like tree-like structures on plants, some of which are trees who, you know, that exist in, a, it's like, it's really sort of like a hierarchy of life, right? You've got like the earth and then you break that down into various, biomes and you break that down into various communities many many of them and you break those down into various populations that make those communities and you break those down into individuals break that down into um you know their various body parts their organs you know that sort of a thing you break that down into tissue yeah. you break that down into molecules or genes and you break that down into atoms and you break you know subatomic well, we particles so far down and so far up right as of now so we know from, from what we can observe that pretty much fractally everything remains the same in our realm until you get to quantum or until you get to like uh, special relativity. It's all the same in that gap, right? Sort of like Newton, yeah, like sort of the yeah. difference between Newtonian and then like non Newtonian kind of physics. Yeah, I see where exactly. you're coming from. Exactly. Yeah, and, and like uh, things start to. It's like when I say that the um, the ocean, or rather the air, the atmosphere of Earth, is like a very less dense ocean. And there's a lot of parallels in how that works, because oceans are just really dense gases. Yep. That's an oversimplification, but it's kind of true, too. To, uh, conceptually, it's, I think it's, it's easier for people to think about like, for example, how flight is possible when you really think of like, because the like insects in particular and mites and really small organisms, viruses, fungi, bacteria, like they get caught on air currents, like water currents, but because they're so small, physics works differently than they right. do for something of our size and stature, right? We right. have to. I can't go really... like this and fly through the air, but if I were. 100 million times smaller i'd be gone right if you drop um like if you drop from a high position you know, a high distance you will crush yourself under your own weight you'll reach escape terminal or not escape, velocity. You'll reach terminal velocity yeah. and you'll, you'll you'll perish you'll in fact if you keep going you'll i think you'll get squished by the air by the air resistance over time right so but if you drop an ant off the empire state building my understanding is it'll still be okay because of the way physics works and how That's their right. bodies, they're not hurt in the same way. Fascinating stuff, you know. Their terminal, um, well, think about it. Their terminal velocity is only, you know, is only going to be, a, you know, is not going to be as, as impactful 
on such a tiny <laughs> organism. Okay, we went pretty far down this rabbit hole. We can climb back. Yeah, out. we did. But I okay, love let's that climb we did. back out. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say here that. Um, so I think I referenced it already, but just for people who want the reference, um, they showed in the research report that in a 2016 article called Size Matters, Evolution of Large Drug Secreting Resin Glands in Elite Pharmaceutical Strains of Cannabis Sativa, that cannabis varieties grown for medical consumption have larger gland heads on flowers when compared to cannabis strains grown for industrial fiber production indicating selective pressure for larger glandular trichomes capable of producing greater amounts of cannabinoids and other secretory products. The larger heads in medicinal type varieties may be the outcome of greater disc cell numbers in the gland head. And Tao, the American one with the Keens, asked, I think, earlier how many uh, secretory discs that the stalked uh, trichomes had versus the sessile. And they just said greater than eight. I think I found, it might have been like eight. I Did found you find that? More. Um, I found something that said 12 to 13 cells. And if you actually go and look at the electron microscopy photography, um, here we are. We can count up to 12, I believe, as what I counted. Hang on. Oh, okay. I got to do um, this. Let's see. So here, here we, we have the cells mar uh, demarcated by a, a neon blue. And okay. and what we can do is in the in in uh, in Figure Three B, you can see there's clearly eight cells here. Okay, I see that actually, yeah. And then down here, we're going to have I think twelve or thirteen. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I count twelve, but they mention up to thirteen. There might be a wait. Hold on, one, one, two. I'm looking at two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, there might be like one eking out uh, because may, cause we're seeing, I don't know if this is a flattened image or if it's a. It's, I, I don't it's, think, uh, I think it's a, um, uh, an it's three dimensional right? perspective. But it's, is it, but it's not flattened, right? It's not 2D, it's 3D. So there might be like another one or two, like. Yeah, sort of on the other no, side actually, that we can see. They actually say in the study 12, 12 or 13, um, somewhere one time. Yeah, um, I, I remember the 12, I believe. I totally oh, believe here we go. that. Here we go. Oh, nope, that ain't it. That's the ratio <laughs> of sesquine to monoterpene. Hold on. Uh, if you fine tooth comb this study, you'll find it. Um, but in fine tooth combing it, I thought, there was something that was kind of hard to wrap my mind around. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the specialized metabolism pathways, like how, how these me metabolites come to be, um, the, the, it's this image here. Oh, okay. I want to ask you about it because I don't fully understand what this I mean obviously these are synthase pathways or hexanoic is one, pathways is the, what it's is called it the, is it the transcriptomics one the, is it figure six yeah. or figure okay yeah uh oh, wait is it six yeah figure six yeah that's the one yeah and so what's ultimately resulting from this pathway are CBD and THC so that's mm -hmm. why we are interested and, or that's why I, that's what grabbed my interest. Um, but <clears throat> so these things, maybe it's a simple question. These are not things you can feed to your plant. You can't really feed uh, hexanoate or, you know, whatever they call this stuff. These, these sort of like enz enzymes, plant enzymes. I don't think this is something you could feed to your plant to encourage cannabinoid development but i think that's sort of the direction that this sort of research should be taken is how do we encourage these pathways to be more active and discourage the inhibitory we pathways have 20 seconds left unfortunately oh shit well, let me 
But but in the in the next seventeen seconds, let me answer your question. This is a heat map for those who are interested. This is a genetic heat map. This is genes in stalked versus bulbous and which ones are expressed most and which ones are not expressed as much. That's what that is. I'll talk to you guys later. Because the topic was so gray, we decided to do another hour and talk about it more, specifically because we ran short of time in the beginning of a pretty cool topic about cannabis um, trichome production and specifically the sort of compounds or the rather the genes that are made uh, in that process. Howdy. Hey Aaron. So I can talk more about the topic. I can bring people up um, to speed, but basically you were asking in this research paper called um, Cannabis Granular Trichomes Alter Morphology and Metabolite Contact or Content During Flower Maturation. And you were asking about figure number six and you weren't sure. What was your question? Oh, it was just that my question was like, this is really confusing. Help me understand it. Yeah. So basically, and it's also like, I mean, I'll, I want to be sort of transparent here that I don't understand everything there is to know specifically in the, I didn't take a, 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 a long enough look to really analyze this figure as much as I could. But I can, I can tell because I've seen other figures like it that this is a heat map. So, um, basically, and there's a description in the um, in the figure. So, like, if we look on the left with uh, at A, there's a bunch of things here: photosynthesis, uh, you know, CHO metabolism, glycolysis, fermentation. Um, we go down here: hormone metabolism, secondary metabolism, metal handling, um, miscellaneous. Uh, yeah. RNA, DNA, protein. Yeah, they, they literally have a miscellaneous here. So yeah, um, yeah. it's a heat map. So these are genes. Um, and what this is implying is essentially that these pre-stocked uh, trichomes, um, or I'm sorry, not pre-stocked. Is, is that what the term is that they're using, pre-stocked? So stocked versus bulbous and pre-stocked versus bulbous. Bulbous, right. And so to say that the pre-stocked certainly looks like a precursor or an upstream version of the stocked trichomes in that yeah. they serve a lot of the same genetic functions. So, ba yeah. So basically like in like the big, the big um, sort of reveal from that paper is that there are true sessile trichomes in cannabis and there are, not true. There are just there are sessile trichomes that terminate and become stalked trichomes, and those are functionally, you know, different. They're also genetically different, and physiologically, their structural, you know, development is different. So, and that's important because they look the same visually until they grow or don't. And so, what this is showing is that. Uh, in the in the A part of the figure, anyways, that stocked versus bulbous um, is very different than pre-stock versus bulbous. Yes. Well, and, uh, uh, my, well my interpretation is that the that pre-stocked and stocked have have a similarity or a a cause effect relationship almost, whereas the bulbous versus the pre-stocked, well. See, okay, so let's, what, let's look well, at lipid metabolism. I'm, well, here, if you well, if you look at the bottom here, we have the color coordination, right? So, basically, some of these some of these um, particular genes are highly expressed. The the red ones, anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so, like the glycolysis super up for the stalked versus the bulbous. So the stalked have it. Uh, highly um, expressed, and the bulbous does not. Mm -hmm. 
So, but if you look at the pre-stalk versus the bulbous, there isn't a, a, a difference because Correct. they're the same. Yeah. That's my understanding anyways. Maybe I'm oh, saying okay. it. Okay. Maybe okay. Maybe it wrong, I get but... what you're saying. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. I was, I was, I was looking at a different pattern in this. Um, in that, you know, like, I thought they were identifying the, um, the chronological order of, of pre-stock to stock. But I can see now, if you look at metabolite transport, ATP synthesis, glycolysis, huge differences between pre-stocked and stocked trichomes. Yeah, but also like the, the miscellaneous group is kind of similar, um, mm -hmm. somewhat between the bulbous anyways, and the bulbous, the pre-stock bulbous versus the stocked bulbous. Sure. Um, uh, those have, and let me just make sure, because I was looking at the yellow to red, Mm -hmm. But there's also a like lighter blue to a darker blue. Dark blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I'm reading this right. But basically they represent opposites, I believe. Yeah. And and it makes sense because like that's what they found in the research that's what they said in the research report was that true sessile trichomes are one way. And then the pre stock trichomes look like sessile, but they're not. And you can kind of look at, you can understand that by looking at their metabolite production, the genes that are being expressed, because ultimately genes are this sort of primary ecological unit, sort of functionally. Some people will disagree with this. There are different theories and interpretations about life, but that's, you know, a helpful way to conceptualize it is that because those genes have functions, um, that are obvious to tell between the two, it's easy to kind of come to that conclusion that even genetically, you can tell the sessile from the pretending to be sessile that will eventually become bulk or uh, bulbous or stalked rather. But yeah. Yeah. And then, and, and then that's an important distinction because this isn't something you're going to be able to like, like we said, smell or see. This is like, this is in maturity and in metabolic production and in synth, synth and um, enzyme synthase within the plant. A lot of different factors. Yeah, we don't we don't as humans we don't really have ways to sort of detect that in the in the way that a technological device might. But um, yeah, so that explains that. Were there other topics? Because we decided to have a whole. It doesn't have to be a whole hour, I suppose, but. What are the other topics right. you want to talk about? I got plenty of shit to talk about. All right. So here's something really cool. Uh, figure five from the same study. Um, so this study was examining hemp variety, or at least this particular set of data was from hemp plants. Okay. Or, or this particular type of hemp phenola. plant called. Specifically phenola cultivar, which is, which I just want to put out here that the reason why people who look at a lot of research reports might find that they see a lot of the same names. Phenola is a big one. Purple Kush is a big one. I see that all the time in research. It's because people have used those in the past and their transcriptomic data, other genomic data is already publicly accessible. So that makes your comparisons and research easier because you can already take that data that other people have sort of looked at. And that's why it just kind of, well, then let's do the phenola more because we know all the synthase genes and we all, you know, that kind of thing. So Yeah, we just prefer to build on, on the shoulders of giants than, than nothing at all. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we know, this is, a, this is an auto flower variety of hemp that um, is used primarily because it has such a fast flowering time and such a rapid maturity onset, senescence, all that happens in a very rapid manner. Um, but what's interesting about this figure five is the cannabinoid expression um, based on the microcapillary samples. So what we can see is that if you look at CBDA, the content of cannabinoids in the leaf sessile and the calyx, the stocked calyx trichomes um, are almost identical. But if you look at CBGA, so the acidic um, 
form of CBG, which is a precursor to THC and CBD, we find much higher levels in the calyx stalked trichomes. And because the CBGA is a known precursor to THC and CBD synthesis, um, we can assume that that's, that is, it's not something they talked about, but, but it's right here in the data. CBG is higher on the calyxes. That's going to say, this is going to produce more, more CBD and more THC upon maturity. I thought that was interesting that they didn't mention it. And like, whoop, there it is. Is this figure five? Figure five? Yes, figure five. Uh, figure five I. Oh, okay. Bottom right. I didn't mention that. Sorry, that the, the cannabinoids from microcapillary sample trichomes. Okay, I see now. Yes. Sorry, okay. so I so, did all that talking without you looking at that. I'm sorry. But the CBG... Uh, no, but it's okay. Say it again? Well, the CBG... CBG is a precursor to THC and CBD. It's, it's part of the synthesis of those two compounds. And the fact that it's in such higher abundance on the calyx stock trichomes um, is something that we would expect to see in something that's going to produce THC or CBD. That makes sense intuitively. Yeah. And they didn't mention it. And I'm, and I'm just astonished because it's such an interesting part of that data. Yeah, and, and for those who want to, like, understand that process of, like, how, you know, metabolically, what happens, what's the precursor to the precursor, and how does that sort of thing happen, you can also look at the figure six that we were just talking about earlier mm -hmm. in uh, part B. You can see that they talk about the MEP pathway and the hexanoate pathway, and they talk, and so you can see it, this is a great diagram as a reference, but, like, there are all of these processes that happen um, uh, with with genes, and um, isn't that coenzyme A or? Yeah, but, and uh, uh, Papa Kana said, "Does it convert by result of oxidation?" And and in this particular case, I don't think so because this isn't something that's exposed to the air. This is a process that's happening. Not to say that there isn't oxygen inside the plant, but this is a process that's happening within the cellular walls of the plant. So I don't think this is an oxidization necessarily as it is an enzyme building synthesis. It's, there's like this structure being built. You start with this little thing, you put this little thing on it, and then you put this other little thing on it, and then you put this chain on it. And by the time mm. you're done, you have THCA or THC if you've, you know, removed the carboxyl compound. Right. And so like in the orange part of this B diagram of figure six, you see the um, there's so there's various genes in the green and the hexanol COA. And then you have olivetolic acid at the end of the orange sort of diagram. Uh, and then you have the C and then in the red. So that links to another pathway. So there's two pathways happening concurrently. And then the end result of those pro those processes. Yes. Yeah. Here we go. So what we're talking yeah. about is this here. We have two pathways that sort of lead to the same process. Exactly. And that red process, that's where he's talking about the CBGA. And so that then becomes CBDAS, THCAS, THCA, CBDA, and also monoterpenes, although not from the red, but from the blue. Right. And so, And we were just talking about monoterpenes. Monoterpenes are more so in the which one? They are in the the uh, stalked trichomes, the right. the and large the dominant the, apical head. Yeah, and the sesquiterpenes are more so in the uh, sessile. And that so, usually that tends to happen in the vegetative foliage. Right, and so 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 that's a great way to kind of um, summarize a lot of this sort of information. So, and the reason why they do this is because it makes sense to first of all, look at that process, but also if we are going to make these statements that, you know, A becomes B, B becomes C, and why would that happen? And what can we use to like, sort of use as a signal to read, to be able to tell, okay, well, if this process is happening, we know that this one's associated with it. So ergo, this is probably what's happening. That's why. So it makes sense, you know, once they do all of the, all of the, uh, recording and analysis and that sort of a thing, you can start to make these sort of generalizations. And 
I think that's really cool. Yeah, and and it's not it's maybe not something that you know researchers will be so quick to do because they like to be concise and tangents aren't welcome in in uh, you know uh, academic academic research like this. So, oh, and then actually, this isn't technically academic research. I should say. Oh, there it is. It is, but it also there's a there's a very interesting caveat at the bottom of this study, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, it says conflict of interest. Oh, and did you read this? I did not. Um, so this study, and I'm not saying that this means that this study is bullshit. It certainly is. Like, not. It, it makes a lot of headway. It's so important. It's so what? important to say. It is important to say. Yeah. And, but, um, but they're, but they're, yeah, so they're just identifying that, hey, we work in the cannabis industry. This research is, you know, funded by licensing and biotech companies that have vested interest in this kind of uh, research. And that's okay. I mean, this is, this is how we get funding for, for real peer-reviewed uh, literature, so. I would say it's okay if you, as long as you say it. It's not okay yes. when you don't say it. Yeah. So. Yeah. So for those who so the for those who want to know that I'm just going to read it here since you put it up there it says Jonathan Page is the uh, I assume chief science officer of Aurora Cannabis Inc, a cannabis licensed producer and biotechnology company. Kim Rensing is an employee at Fibic. Fibix. Fibix. I had my cursor. I had my cursor on the S and I thought it was a dollar <laughs> sign and I was like. That's a weird name, but Fibix Incorporated, the you software. You, you invisibility cloaked the S. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it, it was a, it, the cursor had the line going through the S like a dollar sign would. So it was like Fibix dollar sign. Oh, Fibix that's so bizarre. The software company producing the Atlas software used in this study. So they definitely had an association with the, you know, <laughs> with the research. And so. That's an important thing to consider always. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I actually didn't do the due diligence to read that part. I was way more interested in the cool, flashy figures and the uh, terminology. Well, but let me tell you just cool from, from my experience. So I, I, got, I have a degree in psychology. Um, I did a lot of work as, as an undergraduate. Um, like my main job was research. Like I literally just did meta analysis of uh, existing data and for a lot of different projects. And, um, you know, 99% of the time, you can get the gist of a study by reading the abstract. But the times that you find a study that it pulls you in so much that you find yourself at the bottom where it's like author contributions and acknowledgements and stuff like that, you can't stop reading. And that's what happened with this paper. So I encourage everyone to go check this out. I, I read it this morning and I couldn't pull myself away for, to even to water the plants. I think my plants are probably wilting. I probably got to do that. But, you know, this stuff is really cool. And I encourage everybody to get into it because we we farm trichomes ultimately as growers. So, Yeah, that's the forest that you're cutting down really is the trichomes, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah I've, I've uh, in the past, I've said this before, so I'll say it again. I think that it would be kind of neat if there would be a way to um breed cannabis plants such that maybe more of the plant is trichomous um in the way that we want it to be whatever that way is not just cannabinoids right because it depends on what you're trying to do but obviously there are there are intents to make like the floral uh trichomes have particular monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes and uh, other sorts of um, esters and uh, aromatics and that's, and also cannabinoid content, of course, and which cannabinoid content you want. But I'm kind of interested in whether or not uh, in this particular tangent, it's possible to have like foliar trichomes be harvestable. Like what if, what if the leaves could be just as good as the flower material? It'd be a very sticky plant. And it might not be, you know, there might be some other challenges associated with that. But could you imagine if like, you know, instead of like 10% of the plant being what's harvested, if like 50% of the plant 
was be hard to sing. I don't know if that would be easier with just um, you know taking the trichomes you already have in the flower and just you know overexpressing that to some degree or overproducing the trichomes or something like that. If I it's just more. If it, I think that's a very interesting concept and a direction that the research will head inevitably because we're all in search of the, the most trichomous plant we can find. Um, um, but totally, I, I, could, I could imagine CRISPR being used to, to um, inject these or, or really really what you would need is some sort of, I wonder if you could apply a foliar spray that would sort of be translaminar that would interact with the enzymatic pathways that could produce trichomes on this. Okay, well, yeah, but you know, it's maybe possible in the, in the future. Yeah, maybe like um, either through like some sort of hybridization, um, like I brought up the tomatoes, right? So like wild tomatoes have, um, a lot more of certain kinds of trichomes than cultivated tomatoes do. Um, obviously, when you know earlier human populations were starting to cultivate uh, <laughs> tomatoes and other sorts of solanaceous crops, you know, like they didn't necessarily, they definitely didn't know what genes were, and they didn't know the same sort of concepts that we had that we do now. Not all of them, at least, especially not the, the really sophisticated ones we need technology to assess. But through that process, they lost certain trichomes and ultimately lost certain compounds, some of which are great to lose because they're poisonous. Other ones, not so much because they might be kind of helpful. Um, so, like, similarly with cannabis, I'd be curious to know if, like, well, we already kind of assessed that, like, the fiber hemp cultivars are like less trichomous and the drug cultivars are selected to have more trichomes and so you know maybe just going through that pathway that might happen just as the root hairs and just how the genes that influence the root hairs which if you're interested you can check out part one on my IGTV but there are genes that are associated with trichomes and also root hairs which is kind of fascinating in and of itself and so maybe a similar kind of thing can happen with cannabis in terms of the um, the multifunctionality and the abundance and the, the production of these mm -hmm. trichomes. Right, yeah, I think so anyways, um, because there are already foliar trichomes on cannabis. So it really just becomes a question of like, maybe- Turning um, the genes on. More so, but if you overexpress genes way too much, you do run into some problems. That's why yeah. you can't just, you can't just, um, you can't just like turn the nod the, the nozzle up. You can't just like, well, let's just crank it to 10 overexpression and see what happens. And you'll have major issues because actually these compounds, a lot of these compounds when they're super concentrated, um, I remember reading this in a research report and I made a video on my Zentanol YouTube channel about it, that um, one of the hypotheses they had about why trichomes uh, are conserved or produced in the way they are, especially glandular ones that have compounds in them, um, are because certain compounds that, like, let's say they were resistant to pests, like those compounds were in the sort of the epidermis of the plant. If they get super concentrated like they are in the plant, um, if they're not sort of um, uh, held together sort of separately, then they'll be toxic. They'll be cellularly toxic even to the plant itself. So these metabolites are kind of a double-edged sword if the plant doesn't have structures to kind of mitigate that. Sure. And so, the, so a great way to do that is to just take the structure, take all those compounds, put it on a dot, put that dot on a hair, you know, and it's away from the rest of the plant. Like, like uh, various terpenes, for example, like if you concentrate those terpenes, they're like cleaning solutions. They're uh -huh. solvents, you know? Dude, I got a, so. I got a jar of, of limonene uh, here that'll take the paint off your car. Right, yeah. So like chemically, if we look at the physical chemistry of these compounds, it's a, you know, the dose makes the poison, right? It's the same thing here. Like too much of it, uh, and and not in the right way can right. be totally deleterious it's, to the plant. It's like 
it's like it's like coming in from working being really thirsty and then drinking for for you know drinking water for 15 seconds versus 15 hours i mean you're gonna drown if you drink water you know there, there's a tipping point everything is great until it's not and then it becomes right. detrimental I, I read a study that was um talking about this exact stuff saying that when you search for these mutant genes to produce you know to oh, let's say overexpress uh terpene production um there's co there's there's co results there's co in uh I'm just going to say the word co-results because that's something I just made up and I think it makes sense. Really what's happening mm -hmm. is there's things behind the curtain. And although you're trying to manipulate this one trait, that those the things that influence that trait influence other things also, such as dwarfism, variegation. And what ends up happening when you go after these mutants is you'll you'll have plants that that don't produce or you know, don't grow the way that they're supposed to. And you may not know until seven weeks into flowering when they just still haven't put on the flowers, but they are so frosty maybe, but they haven't actually produced any budlets. I don't know, example. It's but. true. It's true. Like, um, you know, you make a great point. It's like, well, like in that fixture, figure we were talking about earlier in the report, like there's there's two pathways for one. There's a there's two pathways that are that are coming together to create this this compound, and in the development of cannabinoids, so many things. There were no there were plants that made no cannabinoids, right? So evolutionarily, in the cannabaceae, you know, in that family, none of the other ones that I know of and maybe this will be not true in the future, but as far as we know, they don't make cannabinoids, only cannabis. So, for, so, and we know that cannabis is the most closely related to humulus, which is the hops plant. And so hop and cannabis put together, so, so they diverged like 18 or so million years ago. You know, I love to talk about that, and I go over all of that in my YouTube video where I talk about evolutionary history of cannabisier and all these other sorts of things. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, why doesn't hop? Why doesn't uh, the hop plant have cannabinoids? Something happened. A lot of some things happened to allow for this to occur over like eight, and maybe the first sort of like divergent populations didn't even have it. But this is a process that's millions of years in the making. Certainly millions of 70 or so millions of years from the Apinantha, which is the genus that is the most basal in the Cannabisiae. All the other ones developed from that, uh, you know, now fossilized ancient, um, well, there was a species, but there are some Apinantha that are still in existence today. But like, it's just crazy to think that like over the course of millions of years, all of these processes occurred um, and they just had a happy little sort of puzzle <laughs> intersection yeah. and that's what happened, you know? So it's not crazy to think that other sorts of things could happen too in a short period of time or a long period of time. <laughs> the right genes have to, you know, not just the genes, but the precursor of the genes, all of these, um, all of these intricacies are kind of happening in motion at once. It's, it's, it's hard to really wrap your head around the, the entire comprehensiveness of it. It, and it, you know that's a, that's well said you know it is virtually infinite because <clears throat> it goes back to like you know you you could trace this stuff back to the beginning of time you know uh, we won't but you could and and i think it really is hard to fathom something that that is that chronologically large yeah i i mean i tried to kind of do that in the... You do a great job, by the way. If anybody hasn't checked it out, definitely do that. Um, Matt's uh, evol evolution of cannabis video is killer. Um, definitely, definitely do, do go look at that. Give him a thumbs up. Give a comment. Tell him what you think about it. Um, yeah, tell me if you like it. Tell me if you don't like it. Like, tell me what you like about it. I always appreciate input. Um, I appreciate you saying that too. I was just going to sort of like, shameless plug, I guess, but like I do go over in the part two video, especially like all of these different factors. And the, do you know the reason why I make the effort to do that on Xenthanol, 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 
this is backwards on my screen, so. You but, should get um, a, a shirt and print it the other way, like an ambulance. So when you show it, it reads right. right. I'll just mirror it when I put it on my YouTube channel. There you go, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But um, uh, this is the case. The reason why I go the effort to talk about, like, the evolutionary, like, beginnings of plants and then cannabis and then mites and then insects. Why does that matter? Who cares? They're now. But, like, it's because people have sort of um, – they have – uh, interpretations about how life came to be or how uh, a certain factor might be might confer resistance versus susceptibility and I think that sometimes they're just not true or they're only partially true um, or sort of a misinterpretation and so it's helpful to know things like for example like uh, the basal sort of insects let's say the first ones on land, they ate like bacteria and other sorts of organisms that got onto land first. And so, but they came from the water. They call, they're, they're basically crustaceans in a way that uh, colonize land, hexapoda in general, and then the insects. And so like understanding that that's how, that's one of the ways that they got to have the complex microbiome that they have because they ate microbes, right? And how they developed over time the ability to break down plant structural like compounds, you know, like cellulose and pectin and cutin uh, with cutinase, cellulase, lignin, lignase. So those enzymes were, were developed by themselves over millions of years, but also their microbiome allows them to do that. So like when people say things like, you know, a plant that's healthy enough just can't get pests. I have to say, well, then why do you think that? Like, what's the, gen like, genetically, this is certainly not true. They have enzymes that break these things down. That's like, it's like an acid dissolving your skin. Like, it's hard to be resistant to that without fundamentally changing your structure. So... Suntan lotion won't help. Exactly. Right. And so I, I go through that detail for that reason. And um, it also can like show you some of the amazing facts about just how that evolutionarily occurs. I even talk about how viruses came to be, or at least the theories that we have about them. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just love that stuff. And I think it helps people understand sort of like how kind of amazingly like statistically difficult to believe that cannabinoids were produced in the first place or really really a lot of things not just cannabinoids but the things even that are kind of banal like leaf volatiles terpenes even like just the structure of cells being together you know like How stomata open up like eyeballs almost i mean there's right. so many things in, in biology and when we study biology we're really looking at a combination of physics and chemistry, right? Biology is where physics meets chemistry. And, um, and that's life. And that is ultimately interesting to us, not just because we grow cannabis, but because we are humans, and we are contributing to this ecology. And it's really interesting to examine how everything is, is has this butterfly effect, and we all interact with everything else. And no system in this entire universe is, is standalone. No. You know, I love to talk about the hollow genome theory. And since you've talked, and since you've said the magic words, I'll say the spiel, but I'll keep it short. There's two big theories that I like to talk about all the time, especially lately, when we talk about how everything's connected. The first one is the hollow genome theory. It's the idea that we're all composite organisms. And it's kind of true, right? It's us and our microbiome. That's our, that's our mycome, all the fungi in our body. Uh, you know, but whether they're good or bad for us, right? So it's also our virome, it's our bacterium, you know, all of those different microbiome, microorganisms that are part of us, on us, in us, around us, even in our environment that, that influence us. And then, so once you accept that that's the case, that, you know, everything's composite, you can kind of see all these inter interrelations being so important. And then the other aspect is the phyllosymbiosis theory. So phyllosymbiosis theory is the idea that 
um, closely related organisms, so phylogeny, so the sort of the um, the development, the evolutionary like lineage of organisms, things that are closer together in relationship are more likely to have similar microbiota associated with them than things that are farther apart, which kind of intuitively makes a lot of sense, but you know, you have to confirm or at least show some supporting evidence where you make such a statement. And sort of those two theories go hand in hand to me because that's basically like, it's a big part of the ecological sphere that I think is important uh, from a functional standpoint when you're like an integrated pest management specialist and you're trying to say, okay, well, what confers resistance to this pathogen? What about this plant allows it to uh, be susceptible? or resistant. Is it contextual? Um, a lot of times it is. Like you can't just pump it full of R genes and expect it to work in all cases because maybe the thing that the process that leads to the resistance, like let's say it's because it produces a lot of trichomes. Well, what if, if we produce too many trichomes, what if we have another problem? What if it's too taxing for the physiology of the plant? You didn't account for that. Oops. Right. Like, you, have rot. like you know, we, when we produce more trichomes, we retain more water. So botrytis tends to set in at that point. So it's a perfect example. Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. Or even more fundamentally, like there's that that can happen. Or the fact that like, um, you know, if you just, again, if you just overexpress these resistance genes that like inc increase trichome production, it might not increase the metabolites as well. Well, then you go back and you increase the metabolites. Well, it's too many metabolites, man. And what you ended up happening is like, you might have some sort of other thing that you didn't think about being a problem or. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and like a lot of times resistance genes or, or rather sort of resistances that are conferred by genes are not just conferred by one gene. It's a bunch of things working together. Um, like we've laterally already said. and longitudinally, you know, things work together side yeah. by side and they work together chronologically down the line. Exactly right. So you disrupt that, which is in a way kind of endearing because you can kind of do the same thing for, and in fact, the same thing does happen for like pests and pathogens where they're ex sort of like them feeding on the plant, they're, I'll use the word expecting, they have like a certain tolerance maybe. But if you disrupt something about that, like um, my favorite one is how I, I have a research report that I read. There's a video that I made about it where um, microbes that were going from soil to the plant um, endophytically inside the plant. So they were selected by the plant in the immune system because the immune system is a huge regulatory tool for the microbiome. If you get past, if you can mitigate and people don't think about this, but even beneficial microbes have to sort of interact with and mitigate and sometimes the immune system of the host. So it's not like the plant is like consciously aware and thinking like, oh, I'm going to allow this microbe in. It's only possible through this like very sophisticated interaction between handshake. the microbes. It's yeah, the three-way handshake, I like to yeah, say. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungus as well. So this, this, sure. This inner this relationship is so highly dynamic. It's happening outside the root. It's happening on the root surface, and it's happening inside the root. And yeah, and so the the microbe goes from bulk soil to the rhizoplane, from the rhizoplane to the to endophytically inside the endosphere. So pedosphere, rhizosphere, rhizoplane, endosphere, and then systemically in some cases through the tissue into the plant leaves and so then a caterpillar comes along in the research report eats the plant or tissue gets the microbe in it and the micro produces chitinases so chitinases dissolve chitin and chitin is the structural uh building block of most insect uh exoskeletons and endo and sort of their insides as well i think it's in your what fingernails too isn't it that's keratin Oh, keratin. That's right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Don't, don't listen to anything yeah. I say. <laughs> so that's keratin. Um, but even humans, by the way, ancestrally, ancestrally to all animals are chitin, chitinase genes. So the ancestral animal of all animals had the ability to dissolve chitin. Hmm. Maybe it was lost along the way for some organisms that sort of went a different way. But 
it's important to know that even humans, we can break down chitin too. You eat some shrimp, you eat some, you know, you might get a little bit of that, you know, that shell into your body. You can break that down. Maybe not as well as something that's more um, sort of evolved to do this. Like but, you know, dog. I'm pretty, like maybe, I don't know. A dog, a dog has the ability to produce more chitinase than, than a human. Oh, I didn't know that. So like, there you go. There you go. Right. So anyways, the microbe gets in the caterpillar and it causes a sepsis because it broke, <laughs> it, it punched holes through its intestinal tract um, just by a matter of being there because it produced these chitinases and it died of sepsis. And so that's a net benefit for the plant. So even if the microbe is kind of circumventing the immune system of the plant, it benefits the plant. And so that can have a selection effect, if that makes sense. So absolutely, like you say, it, it's extremely dynamic. Yeah. It's extremely dynamic. Yeah. And as dynamic as it is, you know, it can, it can, you don't have to know all this stuff to, to grow really good weed. Um, no, you don't. But, um, but certainly that. the more, you know, the better you grow and it's, you know, getting to getting your weed to a B plus, as I would call it is, is pretty easy. Getting your weed from a B plus to an A plus takes mastery. Yeah, and 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 I guess it depends on what your definition of those terms are, but I highly agree with you. Like you don't need to know any of the things I just said to cultivate well. Yep. I mean, you could like I mean, this might be a contentious point, but like I know people who are complete novices that have, you know, just by doing a couple of things right and having the right environment, they were really helped out by that, in my opinion. Didn't happen to deal with pests. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. You know, like, what can you do? But, like, they just, like, as a matter of course, didn't have a problem. And they grew, in my opinion, pretty good stuff. Like, pretty good is relative, right? But, like I said, like, they, they were happy with it. And they got a great use out of it. And it was good enough for them. And it was enough for them. So, yeah, that like, mean, dude, after 15 years of doing this and like, you know, 10 years professionally, I'll, I have I have bad crops all the time. I have stuff, you know, I have bugs attack. I have um, maybe there's clouds for two weeks, like 2019. We had two weeks of clouds. I lost 80 percent of my harvest due to botrytis and uh, just lack of photosynthesis, lack of, you know, chemical energy. And um, yeah. I, so you know, it's happen. funny. Where are you located? I'm in Northern California uh, in, in, uh, in an undisclosed county. This county is getting crazy, so I'm not even talking about it right now. But, uh, okay. but I'm in Northern That's California. Fine. I'm in Southern California. And I remember 2019. Yeah, the latter part of 2018 and the first part, so like, you know, like the winter sort of transition yeah. from 2018 to 2019. I remember I was working with these cut flower growers. And so they were growing Gerberas and roses and that sort of a thing. And they were having huge budget problems because they budgeted a certain number of cut flowers to grow. And what was the problem? It's just what you said. We were also afflicted by high cloud cover, which is not why you grow in Southern California. That's right. It's like they had like twelve percent less, twelve percent less production, if I remember correctly, which was and, big and for them. Lucky. The margins are small. Yeah, yeah, margins are small, and they're lucky they had any margins at all. Um, they, I, I hope they have maybe supplemental lighting, which is how they survived. But I didn't have any nope. then, and it was hell. It was hell. No, they had no, they had no supplemental lighting, all greenhouse grown. So what they had to do was. I mean, Gerbera comes from Africa. Gerbera, I mean, of course, it's been quite derived because of, you know, cultivation and breeding and all that sort of thing. But the original Gerbera daisies come from Africa. So, and they're very used to particular climates in the African continent. And Africa so, makes highly specialized everything. 
Africa is a big place. I, I bet that's, that accounts for part of it. But sure, sure. Yeah, okay. But just well, extreme well, conditions. There's such extreme conditions that it, that, oh yeah, Fido, represent Africa. Yep, that's our buddy, Fido. Yeah. There you go, Fido Alchemist. Yeah, exactly, right? So, yeah, buddy, I, um, I like, I think, if I'm remembering my geography right, because I was actually looking at, I was, I was looking at a video that was kind of talking about, move, like, sort of the biogeographic influences of like the African continent so like for example you know if you go north so if you start at the very south of Africa I my understanding and fight alchemists let me know if I'm wrong or right here would we love South Africa P perhaps so um but like if you go to the very bottom I believe there's some more arable land it's a little bit cooler especially around the coast area um, but there's some crags and that sort of a thing I think close to the Cape Cape, uh, Cape Hope, Cape New Hope. How do I say that? I always oh, forget. What? Fido, Cape in, dude. <laughs> yeah, don't make me look like an idiot here. <laughs> but um, it's a little bit more like the climate. So like there's there's not one, I think, but two deserts in Africa. Let me just fact check myself really quickly here. Oh, I'm gonna Fido chimed like... in. He said, yes, sir. Camp Ho I, I'm guessing you're he's talking about Cape Hope. Cape, Cape, yeah, Cape, Cape of Good Hope. Hope. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. So yeah, there are, so there's the, um, there's obviously the Sahara, which I, I'm led to believe means desert. So Sahara desert is kind of um, redundant. Yeah. Uh, we we hope, love right? to be yeah. redundant in English when we don't know what a word means. Right. <laughs> so there's this massive desert in Northern Africa, right? And so like, as you go up, you know, there's kind of like this sweet spot in the center, and then there's like this desert, right, in the north. And so, like, things that might have to, things that over time have migrated maybe from, like, the Eurasian continent to, like, the Middle Eastern sort of peninsula, what we now call that, and then sort of into Africa, too. Like, mm -hmm. there's sort of, it's really interesting because of, like, the way that um, sort of the dynamics of rain and, and climate sort of in aggregate kind of effect. So like you have this sort of lock-in where you have a desert in Africa and also other parts of the world are kind of like this, but then you have these other sort of sweet spots. And I think uh, central China is like this too, where um, like the Tibetan plateau it, for the, for most of like the last, I want to say like at least the last 10 million years or so, the Tibetan plateau has been really arid and kind of cold even. Um, in a lot of cases. So, and like, I guess the monsoons, um, what was it? What was I, I was reading about this because it was, it had to do with cannabis because the origin point of cannabis is thought to possibly be like what is now like Central Asia near the Tibetan plateau. Right. Um, area. And there was something about, I think also, so like the Indian continent, for those who don't know, didn't used to be a part of the rest of that part, that, that sort of continent, sort of where China is. India, before then, was all the way in the south, where like we now think of Antarctica, mm -hmm. right? And so it just moved from the South Pole, basically, and it over millions of years, it moved up, in, I think like 60 or 50 million years, it just moved up into the, and it just smashed into what is now like where China is. And, it cre and that's how the Himalayas were created. And that had a great effect on uh, sort of monsoons and that sort of a thing. Uh, Fido Alchemist says, did you catch me there? Did you have a... Is it all good? Uh, unless I missed something, I don't know. I'm reading, uh, I was reading Fido's comment okay. also why, why the Western Cape of South Africa is a biodiverse hotspot, the Cape floristic region. Yeah, so there's these various floristic regions and Fido Optimus makes a good point about like, well, and also actually kind of switching gears a little bit, Speaking of biodiversity hotspots, I want to talk about this because we mentioned cannabis evolution. So, um, what was the genus? I'm I'm blanking on it. 
Perisponia. So there's a cannabis, there's a can, cannabis genus called Perisponia. And in my video, I talk about this a lot more. Perisponia is very unique because it's one of, it's like the only like um, non-legume plant that has uh, sort of rhizosphere interactions with um, rhizobia. So nitrogen fixing bacteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are other plants that have similar sorts of, sort of, they, they affect, they uh, interact with what are called diazotrophs and other sorts of like um, sort of micro, sort of mycological or bacteriological interactions. But why Perisponia is so special is because I saw this research report and it's in the video. It's in my cannabis uh, integrated pest management review 2019 part one. It might be in part two. I think I talked about them both, but basically long story short, they compared Perisponia genes to the legume genes, or I think Medicago truncatula, which is uh, alfalfa. And what they found was that they had the same homologous genes. Why is that important? Well, it means that Perisponia isn't, it didn't develop this uh, independently. It means that it implies that um, only Perisponia, right? No, it implies that only Perisponia conserved these genes and in all of its other relatives so all the other cannabisi and literally every other plant that shares a basal ancestry with legumes just lost it huh Does at that, least the that, extent that that, that, that says to me that there was nitrogen available maybe well the other thing is that perisponia developed across the Wallacea line, which is a biodiversity hotspot. And it's very special because things that move from the Wallacea line, which is like, which separates like Southeast Asia with Sol, with Sahul, which is okay. like the Australian continent. If I remember if I'm, if I'm pronouncing it right. So like the Wallacea line is this like line where things that move from there to the here, mm -hmm. to like past this, they develop very oddly and very differently and very uniquely from their relatives where they came from. It's, um, that's, that's sort of like the um, speedy island evolution thing that I learned in anthropology yes. a million years ago that I can't remember the name of. Yeah, and you also get like really weird things with like deep sea gigantism where like mm -hmm. things that are in the in the deep reaches, they get literally large. And I'm I understand that to be the case because it allows them to conserve body heat, I think, um, or something like this. But I presume uh, there's multiple also, functions, but surely probably. That there's a reason they were able to evolve so large. You know, obviously resources is number one, abundance of resources, right. but number two, yeah. maybe uh, conservation of energy. Sure. Definitely. And then the other thing is that um, you also get like island gigantism where things yeah. that are on island get really large for some reason yeah um and so yeah like so it's just kind of cool to me that the perisponia genus um well there's a particular held on to that species. nitrogen fixation ability but then why is it that all other extant species just don't I have would, it I would, that's and the, obviously now we're in speculation land but i would presume um either they didn't whatever species that that it was at that time had less nitrogen requirements or that there was an abundancy of nitrogen so much so that it's no longer off gassing but maybe um binding to the soil in some way so like normally right now when we go feed our plants um a nitrogen-based fertilizer part of it just off gases just leaves into the to the environment but maybe if there's an abundance of nitrogen in the air, it is there. There's like a reverse action happening in the soil. This is all speculation. I don't know. But what do you no, think? Cool. No, it's I. I mean, there's two things that occur to me. One of them is what you're saying, kind of that like there was some sort of abundance, so that the symbiosis, because there's cost to symbioses, even mutual. Well, there's cost to parasitism, but there's also cost to uh, uh, beneficial symbioses or mutualisms. Mm -hmm. So there are costs associated with mutualisms as well, partly because, like I said before, 
the immune system is sometimes mitigated, which can lead to problems, where you have a beneficial microbe that like has a mutation and now it's a pathogen. Maybe it like, maybe one of the genes that lets it, um, maybe something mutates so that it is able to, or what happens eventually is that it sort of takes more nutrients than it gives, or it um, maybe or like maybe dissolves. I was gonna say, maybe it's yeah. always been able to get into a plant through a particular pathway and it still is, but now it is pathogenic. So it's still entering yeah. the plant in this, with the same mechanisms or enzymes. And now, but now it's bad for the plant. Right, exactly. So that's possible. So it's possible that, I mean, saltwater underscore says an ex extinction event that the one species survives somewhere, maybe. But then like, why is it that the, so to bring this into context, that would mean that in the Rosal, so, so Cannabaceae is a family of plants and Perisponia is a genus in that family. But the Cannabaceae is related to a bunch of other plant families that are in the Rosales order. So the Rosales is a massive group of plants. And there are leg and I bring this up in the video that like the um, the legumes, like so so the ancestor that had all the legumes and, and also cannabaceae, that ancestor must have had those genes. Right. And yet hundreds of thousands, well, maybe not hundreds of thousands, thousands of plants, maybe dozens of thousands of plants just don't. Why? Yeah. It's probably multiple reasons, right? And it could be, it could be that things became, it could be that the symbiosis was not uh, fitness. <laughs> it, it did not make you fit for whatever reason. Could be because there was an extinction event. There certainly have been a couple of different extinction events since the estimated times that these groups developed and then to now. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that growing, it could be though, that moving to the Wallacea line had a big impact on that. And I think that's where, that's where my mind goes. That something about the Wallacea line. Huh. So, so essentially once it's crossed over this Wallacea line, um, the environment changes so drastically, but so drastically so that it must adapt, but not so drastically that it can't survive. And that is precisely the condition that speeds or over specializes evolution, I believe. Yeah, I just want to bring up my video here. And I have the volume off just so that I can, I have a graphic. I have a reference. I forget my own references. Fido, um, um, the separating line, I believe is the, the, uh, the Himalayan mountains, if I'm not mistaken. No, no it's the, um, the, the, the separation line for Wallacea is, I actually have it in here, I think. Perfect. Good uh, question, Fido. Man, I'm always stoked question. when Fido joins, because he's like, he's also one of, like you, he's one of the smartest guys I know, I think. And I'd, <laughs> I'd really like to get him on one of these chats, but he's, uh, he's so busy. So Fido, whenever you're ready, dude, let's do it. So, Okay. Um, it's between, it's kind of like between Borneo and, uh, Sulawesi, 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 kind of near, so like where Java is, kind of like where New Guinea is. There's a couple of different lines. There's the Wallacea line, the, the, I think, Weber, Weber line and the Lidecker line, um, which uh, are all kind of, Wallacea for me. uh, W A L L E. C E A. Well, A C E perhaps is I a better knew, way I to knew it had a Latin ending, and that's what I was messing up. Yeah. Technically, just for those who don't know, the A E ending is E, not A. Um, like, e -E -E like Caesar. Like Caesar. But technically, it would be Keezer. Uh -huh. Keezer. Because it's the hard C, technically, in the old days. But, anyways, that's really not important to now. <laughs> Unless you're like me and you're super, super uh, 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 fastidious. Yeah, or I, I just call it data driven, man. I, you know, it's it, we're sponges, dude. And if and if your sponge is drying out and you're not collecting uh, inputs, then I guess you're just getting crusty and old. But not the, you. Um, we're frosty. We're soft. So okay, so I put here that. Um, uh, I, I have a research report that I've cited in the video. 
Um, but it mentions that uh, Wallacea contains a very high percentage of endemic species. So.